The power of flowers, plant friends, it is a real thing. Not only do flowers add dimension and color to our gardens, whether it's indoors or outdoors, but they also just bring us joy. I mean, who doesn't love a sunflower just smiling down on them from an outdoor garden or maybe looking up at them from a vase? When I first got into gardening, I was super fixated on the food that I could grow. I wasn't as fixated on flowers. But what I'm realizing is growing flowers in your garden can be as appealing as growing food because not only are they beautiful, but flowers are pollinator magnets. We need them. It's important. They are crucial to a happy, healthy garden and a happy, healthy mind. Melody's flower garden bed is one of my favorites in her whole garden. I have been so curious about cut flower gardening, and I connected with today's guest, Brooklyn. We connected on Clubhouse. I then slid into her DMs and started picking her brain about what cut flowers I should try as an ultra beginner. And since the moment we started chatting, I knew that I needed to bring Brooklyn, her passion for plants, her sensitivity and knowledge to this community. It's such a fun chat. I can't wait to bring it to you, plant friends. Welcome to episode 128 of Blue Mango Radio. Hello, hello, my sweet plant friends. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. Oh my goodness gracious, the Catskills have come alive with summer, really. It's not even spring. It has been so fun. Melody's garden is in full swing. I hope you are watching us on YouTube. She's in a few YouTube videos of all sorts of garden projects that we're doing. Go check it out. The house plants are blooming. We're moving again. There's so much going on, especially with the launch of the Garden Party platform this month too. It's been a very exciting month, and I hope that you have been having a beautiful week and month as well. So a few thank yous. Thank you to Alexis, Samantha, Elle, and Madeline, our newest Patreon Plant Friends supporters. If you might be interested in supporting the podcast, you can click the link below. Brooklyn Cherie, our guest today. The plant lady, she has her hands in many planty pots with her own flower farm called Petal and Herb Farm. She also works to improve the opportunities for children and families in her neighborhood with the Cool Choice organization. And she's the host of one of the largest planty groups on Clubhouse, your grandma's garden and house plants. She is awesome. We have had such a fun conversation that I can't wait to share with you guys on basically the first steps towards a cut flower garden. We all have dreams of the Martha Stewart poppy garden, you know, that I read in Martha Stewart Living, but Brooklyn really breaks it down and helps us understand, okay, what are the first steps we need to take? What are really great starter flowers to start growing? And it's such a fun conversation. She's such a deep well, and, you know, it was part tutorial and then part like homage to our mothers, which I really appreciated. So anyway, I will let Brooklyn speak for herself. So why don't we dive in into the power of flowers? Let's go. Brooklyn, welcome to Bloom and Grow Radio. I'm so excited for this conversation. I'm excited too. It's been a a little bit of a long time coming, but it's the right time. You're one of my new plant friends that I met on Clubhouse and who I want to be when I grow up because you're a cut flower (laughs) farmer. And the more that I think about garden planting, the more I get obsessed with flowers. And I know our community is really excited about this conversation on cut flower farming basics. But before we dive into that, I have had the pleasure of getting to know you through Clubhouse and through the Grow Food for Life Summit that we did. But do you want to introduce yourself to our community and tell us about all of the different planty entrepreneurial endeavors you currently do all at once? Yes. And thank you, Maria, for having me. You've just been so sweet and welcoming from the start. And I appreciate you. I'm Brooklyn. I am a flower farmer. This is a switch from what I would normally do as a grower. Um, I was growing food plants at first. And then something about flowers, the versatility, the beauty, it's just so much that you can do and the joy that flowers bring. I kind of just switched gears this past year, 2020 in the fall. I decided that I am going to go 100% in with flower farming. And I'm here in Denver, Colorado. We run a plant studio here for kids. It's called The Cool Choice. And we're teaching kids how to grow and their families. And it's just fun. And that's me. Is your flower farm like in your backyard or are you farming like in a kind of greenhouse or something like that? 
Okay, so we live on a half acre, which is not huge. So we're considered as an urban farm, but we are certifi- certified by the USDA as urban farmers. And we farm in our backyard on maybe like a quarter acre of land. And we just use what we have to grow food. So yeah, right in our backyard. <laughs> The amount of stuff you do every time we talk, you're like juggling so many things. You're so impressive. And the flowers that you grow, are you selling them to local florists? Are you bringing them to farmer's markets? Like where do the flowers end up? The flowers, I work with a lady named Bree. She's a florist here in Colorado and we kind of partner together. I grow, she designs beautiful bouquets. And so we have that connection and Recently, DoorDash has this thing where you can sell your flowers too. So we partnered with them. And so it's just kind of cool to reach more people. But I work with her. I don't have that gift that I to design or that desire. So I work with a florist and she takes care of my babies. I love it. That's amazing. So this episode is going to be geared towards the growing aspect of cut flowers, not the cutting and arranging. We're going to have my wedding florist on for an episode later on that. But, you know, it's interesting thinking about flowers in the garden. I think I've always been so fixated on growing foods, specifically tomatoes and basil and growing herbs and edibles that I've never really considered flowers. But Flowers are important, I feel like, for so many different reasons. Obviously, they're beautiful and incredibly joyful, but they're also like hugely important for pollinators, which are what make the tomatoes grow, right? Like, why would you suggest that everybody has flowers in their garden? I think you you hit a very important part. Number one, if you have a growing space, you want to kind of make it an ecosystem. So welcoming to the pollinators, as well as you can use your flowers for compost as well for later. Some of the flowers serve as dual purpose where you can make teas and they're edible. And so they're good for you as well. And you're bringing joy to people as gifts. And I'm a hundred percent believer in having flowers in your growing space, even what it does for sight, like the different points that it makes when you're doing your garden design and layout, it just can create an experience and an environment that is just comfortable and, and relaxing for so many people. And I feel like, and I just will share this really quickly, my first encounter with flowers was from my mom and we used to help her plant. And of course I didn't want to do that back then, but my mom passed away last year. And so when I'm growing, I'm thinking about my mom and I'm like, oh, my mom would love this. And, and just that connection. And I feel like that seed that she put in me so many years ago is, is like, birthed out now to what I'm doing in, in, in my purpose and passion. So it can get really deep, but also just be something as simple as bringing a smile to someone's face. That's so beautiful. My mom and her old house, my parents just moved to Florida, but in the old house, she grew 350 sunflowers on her front lawn every summer. And it was always a battle with the chipmunks of like how we would get those sunflower seedlings like not eaten, but she would have basically a sunflower field in her front yard that she got to look at through her office window. I always now will have one sunflower in every home that I just will buy like a little seedling in the pot to think of her. And they recently just relocated to Florida and she's going through a little bit of a, I guess, landscape shock, like just Florida, like all the plants that she used to grow in New York, like are not going to survive down there, but she planted it. They have like this tiny backyard in their rental and she planted like 20 sunflowers and has this whole sunflower thing. But it was very interesting to watch her use that sun, those sunflowers almost as a way to anchor her to that feeling of home, even though everything else around her is so different. And I do think flowers do that. And I've been doing a lot of research on flowers. And also I feel like there's research or there's a theory that like from an evolutionary standpoint, like we know that flowers turn into fruit, like flowers could be a source of food. So also like we are innately kind of attracted to them, like from a biophilic kind of standpoint. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Yes. Wow. Yeah. That's, but it's so true too, though. So it it makes sense. So now that we've basically said everybody has to do flowers, whether for emotional or also just like pollinator benefits of your garden, I do think 
that flowers are intimidating to people who like me have only kind of been obsessed with growing basil or a tomato. To me, they feel very foreign and like, I'm probably going to mess them up. And I feel like I don't know what to choose as a beginner. So for a beginner, beginner, flat person who wants to grow a little bit more joy in their life, what would you suggest? Like, how do you evaluate seed packets and species? Like, how has your passion for flowers developed and what would you recommend a beginner? Okay. So I just kind of jumped in and thought like, oh, I like this. So I'm just going to give it a try. That's not always the best way to go. Although, you know, you'll try. I always encourage people to try because you're going to try. If you're listening and you like a certain flower, you're probably going to try it anyways, just because you like it, right? Absolutely. Here's a a few tips. You know, you do want to know what zone you're in. Um, That's so important. I know you guys have been doing your series on gardening and I'm sure you talked about knowing your zone and you can find that out just by going on the USDA's website and figuring out what zone you're in because that's important. Um, Unfortunately, I'm in zone 5B and so my growing season isn't that long. I also live in Colorado and our soil is very clay-like. It needed a lot of amendments going into the soil nutrients. It's just a lot of things that you have to consider before even starting because much like your food plants, Flowers require different soils, lighting, things of that nature, temperatures as well. So just do your homework on that before you even, you know, pick up a seed packet. So you mentioned the seed packets. Read the seed packets. You know, I've watched, I've read the seed packets. I've watched YouTube and I even bought books as well. There's also podcasts that are out there, different things that you can listen to to do additional research, right? So make your wish list if you like zinnias, if you like dahlias, if you like lisianthus, whatever, gladiolas, make your list, read those packets read from the company that you're going to ship from, read about them, their practices. If you want to have an organic farm, make sure that the people that you're buying the seeds from have the same practices as you have before you even start. So that's a little bit of homework before you're even starting planting. So I would say the easiest flowers to start off with are going to be some annuals. I'll give you guys the annuals first. Some flowers are easy. I think they are extremely easy. There are so many different varieties from height to color. They're just beautiful and they're a a crowd pleaser. You can't go wrong with those. Zinnias are another summer annual that very easy to grow, very beautiful. There's so many different styles and textures to choose from. You really can't go wrong with those. I know a lot of people don't mention this next flower a lot, but I like it. I think it may be not get as much shine, but straw flower is very easy as well. It, you know, the soil requirements are very minimal. It is like, it'll survive, you know? So if you need a win, try straw flower. It's very textured and it's good as a dried flower as well. I just Googled it because I've never heard of that. They're so cute. And there's a lot of blooms. It almost looks like a cross between a zinnia and a sunflower. It's got like tons of little petals on the side and like a big bright center. Yep. And if you touch it, it's like straw. Like it, it makes sound like... I don't want to say like a broom, but it has that name for a reason, right? So definitely try those out. I would also recommend snapdragons are very easy. I love snapdragons. I know we were just talking about those. They're very beautiful. You can give very long stems as well. The color varieties are insane. I think they look great in bouquets as well. And if you just had those, how many was that? One, two, three. I think it was four. Sunflower, zinnia, strawflower, and snapdragons. It's a good starter kit. If you have the travel bug, if you dream of seeing the cities and plants of the world, I have a great podcast recommendation to add to your listening roster plan, friend. It's called Women Who Travel from Condé Nast Traveler, and it's a podcast for anyone who loves to explore places both close and far from home. Join host Lale Arikaglu, who has a particularly delightful voice and British accent, each week as she shares her 10 years of experience as an endlessly curious and passionate global journalist, as well as the story 
stories of self-identifying women travelers from around the globe. Though travel and adventure has historically been publicly claimed by men, Women Who Travel creates a space for anyone excited about global issues and traveling. From the depths of the Patagonian wilderness to walks through Europe's oldest cities, Women Who Travel immerses you in the travel experience featuring sound from around the world alongside guest interviews and listener-submitted audio diaries. This tableau of sound brings the inspiration and joy of this community of travelers to wherever you're listening from. Women Who Travel is available now wherever you listen to podcasts. That's a good starter kit. And I think people would get mad if I didn't mention Snap Peas and Cosmos as well. Daisies are easy too. Look, I feel like I'm going to keep going, but I, I wanted to give you guys some options because Cosmos are a classic. Sweet Peas are classic as well. Poppies are easy too. I just want to say poppies because this year in the winter, I literally put them all into a container and just threw them on the soil and that's it. Like I didn't cover them. Are poppies an annual or a perennial? They're annual. Oh, they are. So one of my biggest indulgences is that I have the subscriptions to Better Homes and Gardens and Martha Stewart Living. And Martha Stewart Living just had a whole spread on her poppy collection. And Martha has like a whole poppy garden. Martha is like goals. Yeah, total goals. Okay, cool. And also let's just before, because this is something that took me a really long time to learn. So I want to reiterate it for people who might still get confused. Annuals versus perennials. So annuals are one stop, one year. You're going to buy it. You're going to plant it. It's going to bloom and then it's going to die and that's it. Perennials are going to come back every year if you're in the right zone, correct? Right. Yep. You have to be in a certain zone. And I will say I did have to backtrack a little bit. For me, I'm in 5B, poppies are annual. So look in your zone. If they are perennials, it's very short-lived. Like I would count it as an annual, but just check your zone and, and make sure if it'll come back. There are biannuals and they are um, they come back every other year. And like foxgloves are an example of that. And they are so beautiful. Oh my gosh, they're very, very pretty. And the color variety is insane as well for that too. So I just wanted to put that third one out there too. And then to me, I'm in rentals right now. We're hopefully going to buy a house in the next year to two years. And as I start, you know, vision boarding that to me, a perennial garden is very appealing because you plant it once and then the plants just keep coming back. So what if maybe I think we've had a lot of people in our community that have just bought their first homes are just trying to figure out their landscapes this year. What are your favorite perennials that you would suggest people playing around with? Ooh, so if you find a space that like you want to be just like the envy of the neighborhood, <laughs> but you also can be patient, you have to have a peony like yes you, <gasps> yes I'm so happy you said that <laughs> you don't have to do anything crazy or buy a very expensive variety or anything like that but I'm telling you that is one of my favorites I love peonies they are just they're beautiful. So that's something it will come back every year. But the thing about them, the first few years, you want to give them time to develop before you go cutting them and, you know, bringing them inside. You have to be patient with them and let them come into their glory, you know, their best selves. So they'll grow great. And, and that's maybe one of the, the number one things that I'll say. Obviously, Roses will come back every year. If you're in a warmer climate, dahlias will come back. And dahlias, oh my gosh, they are in my top five. They're beautiful. They come in so many different varieties. They're just gorgeous. So that's something that I would suggest. Yarrow is a really great filler. It'll come back every year. What's it called? Yarrow? Like Y-A-R-O? Y-A-R-R-O-W. Okay. Yep. So it'll come back every year. You'll also be able to do, if you want to do echinacea and I'm, it's a cone flower. So if you want to do it, uh, 
purple coneflower or different pow pows. Oh, it's a white pow pow you could do. That will come back every year. And depending on how many you like to plant, I've seen them plant it like in a wild flower type of way because it's a good pollinator. So having that come back, but there's so many different color varieties. Mm -hmm. That's a good one to have as well. Um, Let me think. That's a good list. Tulips will come back too, but you know, you can't keep cut. Like if you cut them, you'll have to replant the bulbs, but tulips is another good one that will come back for you every year. Okay. You've given us so many good options. Now, another thought that I had and something that my mother was very good at doing is strategically, we also had a listener write in asking about this, like succession planting so that you have something in bloom in your garden all season long from like the daffodils coming up early spring to the Montauk daisies, to the sunflower, to, you know, how can you tell when the flower blooms? Like, how would I plan that? There are some flowers that you'll start in the fall and then they'll bloom early spring. So you mentioned daffodils. You can try to overwinter, which is when you overwinter something, that means you just, you let it go dormant and it'll, you'll plant it in the fall or, or early winter, and then it'll come up during the spring. So some of those uh, varieties that'll pop up for you during springs are are tulips, the daffodils, ranunculus. You can do the poppy, as I mentioned, snapdragons, anemones. What else can you do? Those are main ones that I can think of right away. Yes. Iris, allium you can do as well. That is something you'll just kind of make a list as you guys are doing your research on the different plants that you like. Pay attention kind of to when their bloom date is and then you'll plan according. So you might start this like this fall. I'll have all my bulbs and corms and all of those things that I need in order to have that first round of spring blooms. If you have a peonies, if you plan on doing peonies, they're blooming. They're almost done blooming um, because it's getting warmer. So that's a spring um, bloom that you'll get. So that's something too that you'll want to add on your spring list. And then you'll go into the warmer months of spring of summer where you'll have your sunflower and the straw flowers and your amaranth and zinnias and lisianthus, the black eyed Susans, which is rutabecchia, cosmos and all of those plants. So our flowers, you want to kind of make a calendar. Like if you're really like, I'm a flower farmer, so I'm going to be a little bit more organized and, and, and timely about it and structured to where I know what's going to come up during this time, during that time, you know, but I would say maybe start with a few different varieties. Don't overwhelm yourself. I'm naming a lot of different flowers in the different bloom times, but I do want to say like, you don't have to have all of these flowers to have a beautiful cut flower garden. Like you don't need all of this stuff. You could have one pot of zinnias and be thrilled you know, or you could have a couple of sunflowers or one echinacea. I think that's a great point. It's like, we're giving a lot of information in this episode meant for people to cherry pick what resonates with them. And I think, you know, you brought up earlier, and this is a very similar piece of advice given on this podcast and a lot of edible gardening, but pick what you want to eat and then figure out how to grow it. I think it's very similar. Pick what flowers you like and then figure out how to grow them. And one thing I will say is as a beginner gardener, Territorial Seed Company, who I worked with, they were a sponsor on the podcast this uh, winter. They have an amazing garden planner on their website. And as I was planning my raised beds, I was putting in the the plants and it, it tells you the garden planner like automatically, you know, computes with your zone. Like this is when you start the seeds. This is when you transplant. This is when they're going to bloom. This is when they're going to die back. And I found that being helpful too. So people, if you're a beginner, you could try, you know, using one of the many electronic garden planners as well. But there's something to also figuring it out by learning how to read a seed packet, I think. Definitely. And I will just one last thing I will say, like you'll have between summer and fall, some of these will bloom all summer long and going into fall until you get your first frost. So you don't have to, if you just love sunflowers, just, you know, they'll produce for you. Just continue to add more seeds if you want to change the variety of color. Like right now I'm working on my fall colors, the chocolates and the burgundies. 
so that they'll be ready for the end of summer, beginning of fall. So you just want to time things out. Like I probably, you know, honestly, I know a guy that he just only does sunflowers, but they're the variety and color and length. It just makes for a beautiful cut flower in general. So what about this term cut and come again? Because I think that's what everybody wants, right? The plant where you buy one plant and then you get to have more than just one flower. You know, you plant a tulip bulb, you're going to get one tulip out of it basically or a couple. Um, What are your favorite like cut and come again varieties that you like? I would say the zinnia has, for me, I think is the the crown on that. <laughs> like you can cut them and they'll come back. Zinnias, hands down. My mom had a lot of echinacea too. Well, I think, no, no rudbeckias. And I do feel like that's another one where you just get so many flowers that I feel like you can cut a few and just constantly have flowers around, you know? Yes, that's a a favorite for so many people. It's a classic. Same thing with snapdragons too, though. Like, be, well, depending on, they produce so many stems, right? You want something too that just will branch off and give you so many different flowers that you can cut them and you don't have to worry about, oh, well, my plant is looking bare or this or that. I know we're going to get into pinching a little bit later, but I think snapdragon is an excellent producer as well. Cosmos produce really good too. Okay. So yes, I definitely want to get into the pinching deadheading, but before we get into that, let's just do a quick like flower gardening, growing basics crash course of potting medium, watering light, like in general. And obviously everybody read your seed packets. It's going to vary a little bit, but if I'm making my first cut flower garden, you know, or raised bed, what do I need to think about? You need to think about soil. Most flowers do like well draining soil. And that basically means like I've mentioned before, I have a clay soil. So that's going to hold water. It's just very tough to work with. So if you are using a well draining soil, you want to have something that maybe has peat moss in it or compost too. You want to ha- add that in there too. So you could do a mixture of maybe if you want to make your own um, a peat moss with some compost and then throw in some perlite. That's a, a good mixture. Also, you can just buy a bag of garden soil if you'd like. I know everyone doesn't have access to certain things, so I I never want to exclude anyone. If all you can do is buy a bag of soil and use a pot or a container, you can grow. You can also use grow bags. There are things with my soil, like I said, that's kind of clay. It just won't work out. Like straw flower, I've been able to just kind of throw those out there and work with it. But if you, if this year you want to do something a little bit more fancier that needs a loose draining soil, go ahead and get a container or a grow bag. Don't let that stop you. Your soil condition stop you from having beautiful flowers. There's so many different beautiful planters out there. You mentioned uh, beds. You can, if you can, you can make a bed and, and start from scratch and build your own soil that way. So whatever medium you use, you want it to give nutrients as well as whatever the the packet says that the seeds need at the end of the day. So make sure you're doing that. It doesn't have to be complicated at all. I do know people that just use compost as well. So, and if you don't make your own compost, you can reach out to a local company. I know people that have gotten compost from a zoo. So just kind of research and you could just use that as well. I know they do that a lot in Europe, just use compost for a lot of their flowers. So that's interesting. So are they heavy feeders, flowers? Because if you're sticking them in compost, do they require a lot of fertilizing throughout the summer? Well, it depends on the flower. Not So when you're starting dahlias, for instance, if you have a tuber, it just likes regular potting soil. I start them in basic potting soil. They don't like a lot of fertilizer. So it's just, when I say a very basic potting soil mix, I sit it in a container and it just grows. So uh, like, It depends on the flower. So you guys really have to do your research. But I do want to say when you're waiting for those blooms to grow or if you see some yellowing on your flowers, you really have to 
feed them. And that's where the NPK comes from. I know you guys probably have talked about that already. The N is the nitrogen, your phosphorus and your potassium. And I feel like the the main two with your flowers, you really want to make sure you have enough nitrogen because that foliage, that greenery, you want it to look green and not yellow or stale. So I use a lot of coffee grains for that. I'll just when I'm done with my coffee this year, I've started just putting the coffee grains into a plastic container, putting water in it, and then just putting it directly on the plants. Last year, I would just take my dried out coffee and just sit it on top of the plant just to add that nitrogen. And then for phosphorus, I'm using bone meal. And you guys can buy that at the store. That promotes the blooming and in your regular plants, fruit formation as well. So Those two are so important with flowers. Thank you to today's episode sponsors. Okay, plant friends, it is no new news that I love Espoma Organics. I use their products indoors and outdoors. They are a family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. So we know that I love their potting mixes and their fertilizers for my houseplants. I've talked about that a lot. But on this episode all about flowers, I feel like I got to talk about the line that they are most famous for. Their line of premium organic fertilizers geared towards different outdoor types of plants. And they call this the Tone Family line. It's a line of fertilizers. They're all geared towards different plants. The first tone that I think a lot of people know about, Espoma is rather famous for it, is Holly Tone. But now they've expanded the line to so many different tones. So Melody and I have been using Garden Tone all spring and summer to get her garden set up. They also have flower tone to boost blooms if you get inspired after this episode. They have rose tone that's created specifically for roses. They have azalea tone, bulb tone for all the bulbs that we talk about in today's episode. I'm using their tomato tone in my tomato grow bags. We use their citrus tone on limey our lime tree. And I've used their Biotone Starter Plus in my whole grow bag garden this year that I will be using in my move. So plant friends, whatever you are growing, indoor or outdoors, Espoma Organic has the potting mix, compost, or tone for you. To learn more about all of their amazing products, visit espoma.com to find your local Espoma dealer or visit my favorite Espoma picks in my Amazon storefront. Thank you, Territorial Seed Company, for being a long-term sponsor partner of the show. Oh my gosh, the tomatoes that I have grown from seed are starting to set fruit and grow fruit. I'm so freaking excited for cherry tomatoes all summer long. But we're not talking about tomatoes today. We're talking about garlic. Territorial Seed Company is the go-to place to order your garlic this summer. I can't believe that we're already talking about garlic planting season, but it's here and Territorial Seed Company has everything you need to get growing. Once you've tasted garlic out of your garden, apparently you never go back. Every gardener I've talked to has told me this. I'm very much looking forward to planting garlic with Melody this fall. And the way garlic works is you plant it in the fall and then you overwinter it and then harvest it the following summer. It's super simple and like kind of a flex if you grow your own garlic that you can share with other people. Brie talked about it on her episode as well. What I didn't realize is it's super diverse. There's hard neck and soft neck different varieties. Garlic flavors range from mild and sweet and mellow to hot and spicy. Varieties come in big bulky heads or smaller delicate bulbs. And at Territorial Seed Company, they like really have every type of garlic you could ever want. Hard neck and soft neck varieties and shallots and other fall and winter vegetable seeds if you are thinking about planting into the fall and winter. Anything you need, they've got it. Check them out at territorialseed.com and use code BLOOM10 to get 10% off at checkout. They are a long-term partner, so supporting them helps also support Bloom and Grow Radio if you're interested in seeds, garlic, shallots, or other planty things for your garden. So once again, check them out, territorialseed.com and use code BLOOM10 at checkout for 10% off. Well, it's interesting, too, because I guess N of the NPK, N is about leaf growth. P is about bloom growth. So I guess, too, planting with knowing that N is important. And then when it's time to bloom, knowing that P is super important. Melody just had me. I'm a garden apprentice to this nice woman, one of my neighbors. And she had me top dressing her flower garden with compost today. The flowers had been planted for about a month. And she says once every six weeks, she top dresses her flowers with compost just to kind of give them a little bit extra boost throughout the season. 
Yes, that's definitely true. And if you don't, the plants will definitely tell you and they'll show you. I know with um, I planted some zinnias earlier indoors and now they're they're tall and they they look great, but they weren't blooming. And so I'm like, OK, they're green. Let me add some bone meal. And sure enough, they're starting to flower and, and they're looking great. So y- your plants will tell you. I mean, but you just want to be in the routine and the habit of had adding, especially as they're they're growing, they're getting bigger. Earlier on, when you're first starting out, uh, the potassium, it's, it's, it helps to develop the root system. So that's going to be very important when you're just starting out too. So just pay attention, but know once you're in the thick of things, and you want those green leaves and you want your blooms, the, the first two, that N and that P the, is going to be very important. And when it comes to light, in my experience, at least with the flowers that I've started this year, I feel like in general, flowers really do need more light than like there are very few shade flowers, right? Yes. Oh, my gosh. Placement is so important. And when I say placement, you need to know north, south, east, west, whatever, the time of day, how much sun you're getting, because I made the mistake earlier on and burnt some roses. Oh, no. (laughs) They only needed part shade. And I just they got burnt up. And so your plants can fry. Although a lot of when we get into the sunflowers and a lot of them are heat tolerant, right? So they need that heat. They want that heat. They don't mind the sunlight, but there are a lot of plants that only want part sunlight. And listen to that because they will fry. It just, this year has been so crazy too, though, because it's so it's like we've been experiencing high 90s and the hundreds. And so in Colorado, we went from winter to summer. So yeah, it's, New York yeah too. it's been weird. So you want to just make sure. And if you guys are direct sowing your seeds and you're not starting them indoors, you want to make sure you put them in the place where they're getting that. Some of them need that six hours a day. They need that heat, you know, 70 degree. They won't germinate without it read back it. So make sure. Yeah. So it is important, Maria. I think it's interesting. I mean, I feel like January, February, I had all this overwhelm trying to plan my first garden, what flowers to order. You know, I think it's super easy to get super overwhelmed. I also just think you just learn so much by doing in that first summer. And even just me leaning into just being like, okay, what does the seed packet say? Really learning how to read a seed packet and interpret that knowledge and get some good books and get to find some good online resources and just figure it out and try. Cause I feel like a a crash course in like flower, like light, whatever, obviously it's going to be dependent, you know, even just snapdragons. I started unsuccessfully. There was a mouse in the greenhouse that ate all my zinnia seeds twice. Mm. So I have one zinnia from an entire packet, but then like something so interesting, snapdragon seeds, said very specifically on these seed packets and shout out to Territorial Seed Company, but you have to expose snapdragon seeds to light for a 12 hour period. They have like very specific seed starting instructions that were very different than the zinnia seeds. And you just kind of like figure it out, you know? And I think there's a lot to say about that, you know, is just kind of empowering yourself and figuring out the seed packet and trying it and maybe sometimes failing and then trying again. Yes. And Let's just take a moment to say mistakes happen or things come up like your mouse. And with me, I left my son to water my plants, my uh, whole tray of beautiful snapdragons. Oh, I can't even think about it. And um, (laughs) he forgot to water them. So when I came back, they all died. And if you don't know this, snapdragons have a harvesting date of like 110 days. So you have to start them early. They're not something, same thing with Liz Deanthus, they take forever. You have to start those seeds very early and your window to just start them over. And it's just, it's a bummer. So things will happen. But the good thing that, and I also want to promote this too, you always can buy seed starts or plant start starter plants or whatever you want to call them. You always can buy those. Like you, you can buy them from the store and you can take care of them and still have a beautiful garden and try again next year. 
you know? I think I think that's an important point. Another thing that I'm just learning through my first process of trying to grow stuff outdoors, I'm really learning what's worth starting from seed and what is not worth starting from seed and what is just worth buying the seed start. Yes. And- <laughs> oh gosh, you're speaking to me right now. I'm like, you know, yes. and I think like I love starting my tomatoes from seed because I get to choose the exact variety that I want, right? Snapdragons, don't think I'm going to start my snapdragons from seed next year. Think I'm going to buy that. Think I'm going to do the zinnias from seed again to try. And I hear zinnias are a good direct sow as well. Like they're easy to direct sow into the garden instead of starting early. But like, yeah, I think there's also something to say of trying to do it all, you know, and then from experience being like, this one wasn't worth it. I'm going to buy my basil seedling starts, you know, like the stuff that's easier to cut or marigolds, you know? So I I thought that was super interesting, but okay. So everybody read your seed packets to figure out the care. Once you've picked what you want, get your timing, right? We covered annuals versus perennials. What about anything to know when either we've started seeds indoors and we have our little seedling that we want to transplant into the garden or we buy one, Any like transplanting things that we need to know about roots and stuff like that? All right. So some plants are very sensitive and do not transplant very well. And I know we've been talking a lot about sunflowers, but I feel like that's a great just place to start. Their roots are very sensitive and I'm rebellious though. This is my first year doing this though. I started them in seed trays, some of them. Not all of them, most of them I just started in ground, but I felt like I was running out of time and I wanted to just, you know, start them and see what would happen. So I did start them in cell trades and so far they're doing pretty good, but you do have some that are sensitive and they will not transplant well. You can read that on a seed packet. It will tell you. They will straight up tell you. Yeah. Yes. Does not transplant yes. well. Yeah. Yes. Amaranth is a filler. A lot of people grow that. That's another one that you might want to just go ahead and start outside direct. So I think the biggest thing and one of the reasons why a lot of people start earlier and just start them in the seed trays is to extend the season, right? So you do get a season extension, but when you're putting them into the ground, just make sure you're you have time to harden the the plant off. So right now I have a whole bunch of filler plants outside that I'm going to sell for bouquets and I'm just letting them sit outside and I'll do that for maybe 3 days. I know a couple like some people do it for like a week or two. It's up to you. You go with your gut, but you do need time to harden the plant off. And that's just helping them to uh, um, acclimate to the environment that they're going to go to. So the plants that I have right now, I have them literally on top of the soil in a tray with the light that they're going to get. And I leave them out there in the daytime and then I'll bring them back in. And then when I'm ready, when I know that I'm going to put them into the ground, I'll leave them for another few days to experience the cooler temperatures at night or whatever the night temperature is going to be, because in my grow room, it's warm in there. Like I have it at at least maybe like 72, 73 degrees at all time, day and night. And obviously that's not what's going to happen when they get outside. So you don't want to shock your plant. So give them that time to, to get you to your, your space, even your plants that you're bringing from home. I mean, from the garden center or wherever you're buying your plants from, you want to get them used to that space. That, space before you put them into the ground. So, Get them acclimated. Yeah. Yes, that's very important to do. Okay, so we've talked about starting, transplanting. Now the big question is best practices for having a nice, juicy, long growing season, having nice, big, robust flowers. And I know the big question is deadheading and pinching, and you're supposed to pinch one flower now to get two flowers later. So please explain this practice because I know it's big with, with cut flowers stresses me out. I know. Right. I know it's something (laughs) you just have to do it. But like one of the things we mentioned already is I think the number one main key is feeding those plants. So fertilizing and taking care of them. Right. Um, You also have the process of pinching and that's, you're going to do that before you did hit, you're going to pinch your plants when they're maybe when they're strong, 
you see some leaves are coming out. So you'll have your first set of true leaves that form, right? You know, they're strong and then you'll get another set of leaves and they'll be strong as well. I always wait for me and and some other people that I, I notice, they wait till they get to that that next set of leaves to know that their their plant is doing good. That you know you're confident, and then the plant will continue to kind of shoot up and produce more leaves. You want to pinch, and by pinching, you're basically either you're going to literally take your thumb and your index finger and take that stem that's growing out from the second set of leaves and you're just going to take it off or you're going to cut it off right there. And you guys can look this up. I, I feel like you would need a visual for this, but it's basically the process of cutting your plant in order to produce more stems and more leaves. It's going to produce more p- plants for you. It's going to make a plant more bushier. Typically when you have a zinnia, it's going to grow straight up. But if you pinch that plant, it'll give you more stems and more stems will produce more plants. Was that good, Maria? Do you got that? Totally. Yeah, I just went through this with Melody. I started those snapdragons I mentioned. The snapdragons made it. The mouse did not. They were too small of a seed for the mouse to eat, but they're very leggy. And uh, I have, I think, seven or eight plants. And Melody was like, you have to pinch. And I was like, I don't know what that means. And so we did an experiment and we pinched half of the Snapdragon seedlings that I have. And I'm just going to compare and contrast like what pinching is. But yeah, she literally was just like, you just literally pinch the top. I mean, we're way past the second set of leaves. Like I think we've got like eight sets of leaves a little late in the game, but she showed me other Snapdragons in her garden that she pinched at an appropriate time. And they have like eight stems on one plant where my snapdragons are just one stem. So I think that'll be an interesting learning experience and something I didn't know. Just make sure you have the space because especially the snapdragons, I was just thinking like how big and how many more stems you'll have. And if you're just planning like, oh, I'm just going to grow a snapdragon and then I'll put another one right next to it. You know, like that's not something that you're going to want to want to put a plant directly next to because you want the blooms. And so that will prevent you from having so many plants to put out into your growing space, especially if you're limited. So, yes. I love it. You can, it's just so obvious. It's, it's a good practice to do. I think most plants you should do it with. And again, it's just that main stem that you have and you're kind of extending and making more stems and creating new leaves. So it's great. So what about that first bud? When we see a flower's first bud, do we pinch a bud back too, to encourage more growth or once a flower throws off a bud, we let that baby bloom? Take it off. I just literally was doing that this morning. As long as it's not flowering, you can go ahead when it's that green little circle and it is surrounded by the leaf. Go ahead. Just take it off. I literally just did that this morning. Okay. So even do it just with the buds as you're going. And is that deadheading? So what's deadheading? Because I know that's another thing that gets talked about. So deadheading is when your bloom, it's it's blooming and it's starting to fade away. It's dying or whatever. Just cut it off. Just cut it off and it will create, you'll get more flowers, more flowers will come out and bloom and, and that's it. That it's very, you don't want it anyway. So once it's dying, is there an area on the stem that I have to cut that spent bloom off or is it just literally removing the actual bud? Like, do I have to go back a node or anything like that? Or is it really just removing the flower? It's literally removing the flower. Okay. Yep. Got you can it. do it with a scissor or you can do it with your hand, but whatever you want to do. Yep. Just getting rid of that. Yeah. So that pinching, especially with those first blooms, that feels like it's going to be a painful practice of being like, oh, I could have a flower. But when you do that, it's going to actually instigate more blooms throughout the season, right? That's the thought process behind it. Yes. Like we were doing that with geraniums because you don't want it to you don't want to send signals to the plant that, okay, we want more flowers. And the plant is like, 
I'm being dramatic, but two two inches tall. Like that's not what you're going for. You want it to focus its energy on building that foliage and and getting taller and getting stronger. So it's kind of like even though pinching that bud at the beginning when I'm like, oh, I want that flower, but instead you're pinching it away, you're sending signals to the plant to grow more foliage to become a more robust plant that can support more blooms in the season throughout the season, right? Exactly, Maria. Okay. Perfect. That's- yep. It's hard to do. Like I it's like when you're first starting you because you're so proud of yourself. Mm-hmm. And you're like, I did this. Oh, it's coming. And then, oh, I got to let you go. I, it's just, but it has to be done. <laughs> it has to be done. And I mean, I even, but logically it does make sense. Cause I look at my snapdragons or even like I have a tomato that has like four leaves and is already flowering. And I removed the flowers because I was like, this doesn't make sense yet. Like, I know you need more leaves to photosynthesize to like make some good fruit for me. So like, I'm going to do that. So I guess it's kind of the same thought with the flowers. Let me hit you with a few listener questions. We've covered a bunch of them. What about, so our favorite peonies. So like my vision board is like a hedge of peonies. Anything specifically with peonies that you would suggest to like extend a good season of, you know, an established peony plant? Peonies, if it's established, that means that you've done what you needed to do to make it become established. So what I'm saying is that if if, if it's established, it's going to last until the season. It, like if it's the 99 weather and once it gets hotter, it's just gone. There's nothing you can do about it. But mo- once that plant is established, you won't really have much problems out of it. It's the part of when you're starting it more so is that when you get this, it comes in like a little stick. And I know we didn't talk about bulbs and the different things, how the plants come, but the peony will come like, it looks like a little branch and it's important to take care of it from that stage in order to have that beautiful hedge of of peonies. But once you get into a ground, into it needs well-draining soil and it needs to be watered thoroughly maybe the first time you're putting it in there and then it when it starts to bloom you'll water it pretty good then but after that you'll you'll be set to go like it's pretty faithful you know what you brought up a good thing we've only been talking about seeds but there are several plants that come in bulbs and corms so any quick like i know dot like melody like planted dahlias she got like corms and lilies she got these you know bulbs or whatever lilies come in so any tips for if you end up buying a bulb or a corm like how to plant those suckers and is it you just put them in the soil and and you water them and they pop out I hate to say that it's that simple, but for me, it has almost been that simple. I will say this. If you go to like a big box store or whatever, I do not care. Open the box and look because you can get, I've been in a situation to where I've opened when I got home and it's mold and there's, it's just disgusting and you can't use it. So that would be my number one. And also research the company that you're buying from if you order them online, but they all have instructions on them. If you're going to do most bulbs or tubers, you'll do maybe like five to six inches into the ground. Or if you're going to do it into a, a container, it needs to be buried about five to six inches. You'll put it in there. Um, some will require water right away. And some of them you don't have to add water to at all until you see the first signs of leaves. And then you'll want to add a little water and put them into the sun. But I add a little um, bulb tone. It's a fertilizer. I put it at the base. Yeah, Espoma Organics. That's my sponsor for our show. Shout out. You didn't even know that. That's awesome. Shout out. Yep. (laughs) It works good. And I will say, I... Because of my soil and and I was trying, like I'm a tester. So I just put that bulb tone in there with a with a prayer and and like <laughs> threw that in there. I'm like, I hope this works for this type of growing environment. And it worked very, very well. And you cover it up, you leave it alone, and it, it's good. Like it's that's it's pretty much that simple. Same thing with the lilies that I've, you know, I've grown. I started those in containers as well. 
I know elephant ears aren't necessarily a flower, but you know, a lot of gardeners grow those. Same thing. You you get the I don't know if they call it a quorum, but you know the elephant ears, they have the mm-hmm. the big I don't know what it's called. Stub. We'll call it a stub for now. <laughs> a stub. And same thing. You buy it, you put it in the container, it needs water. I keep it in a very hot um area indoors, but It's easy, guys, for the most part. I don't, I think the most stressful part about it is, I won't say it's the stressful part at all. It's stressful for me because I do a a lot of plants. I was about to say is is the quantity, but I would add if you are going to buy uh, bulbs and you want to plant them in the fall, now is the time to do it. You'll catch a lot of sales and you'll get a lot of varieties now versus if you start buying them in the fall when you're going to put them into the ground. So that's just a little tip there. That's another thing that's blown my mind with gardening is number one, you can have like a year round gardening season, even if you have a winter and it's all about that fall planting for the spring. And I've learned because I've worked with Territorial Seed Company, they specialize in garlic. And I didn't even like know about garlic before I started working with them. And I was like, oh, this is so cool. Like you plant it in the fall and then you've already got something in the spring. Like that's so fun. I would say this, and I'm saying this because it's on my mind. And and I know you said you're going to give up on Snapdragons, but there's a flower farmer. um, Her name is Alex. And she overwintered Snapdragons. And she put them into the, you know, just the seeds are so small. She just kind of spread them out. And then she did a light mulch cover over them just to kind of keep them somewhat warm because they can take a little bit of a frost. Snapdragons Mm -hmm. can. And I lie to you not right now. And she's in Vibe B, I believe. She has Snapdragons. Beautiful. Wow. So wait, so outdoors, she sprinkled in the fall snapdragon seeds in her ground outdoors, yep, covered outdoors. it with mulch, let it snow. Heavily mulched. Yep. Mm-hmm. So put a nice thick mulch covering between the seeds and the snow, had a Colorado winter or a five zone five winter. And then because the seeds were already there, they basically started outdoors. Yep. And grew. Wow. What's her handle? Let's go check her out. We'll put her information in the show notes so people can check her out if they're interested. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Well, to wrap this conversation up, can I even force you to tell me like what your top five favorite flowers to grow are? And this is just a personal thing, not a not a beginner versus advanced thing, but like what are your Brooklyn favorite flowers that bring you the most joy? Okay. So I'm going to go first with dahlias are maybe my number one, just because they are just so big. You can get tons of blooms and they're just, the color span is just, they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm going to also say sunflowers would be number two, even though they could be a bit dramatic. They're just faithful to me. I love a faithful. So My next one is going to be, it's not a flower, but it is a leafy green just for summer, is a hosta, just because it comes back every year and it's not anything that you would put in a bouquet if you guys don't know what hostas are, but they were my mom's favorite. And so every year in my garden, I have to have those. I love that. That's a number three. And then my last two are, I'm not going to do flowers only because I feel like our additions, our foliage that we put into them makes our bouquets and makes the experience great too. And I'm going to say basil. I know you mentioned basil. <gasps> I was going to say that too. I was, I okay, you tell me you're five and then I'm going to tell you a funny story. But yes, okay, okay. basil. They flower, it's so many different types yeah, of they basil. Flower. And they flower beautifully and you can go from a deep purple to a beautiful green in foliage. They're so versatile. And then... I'm also going to say, I'm going to lie and I'm going to, oh my gosh, I'm getting stuck between doing a flower. If you need two more, I'll give you an extra. Okay. An, an extra would be, oh my love. Oh my gosh. I, I'm just messing it. <laughs> okay. I, I'm just going to say, I love snapdragons. I love peonies. <gasps> Amaranth in a bouquet. Oh yeah, my gosh. Beautiful. As an addition. I'm just beautiful. Gonna stop right there. I'm That's just a good gonna filler. Stop right there. Yes, okay, well, I'll tell yeah. you, 
since this episode is turning into like a dedication to our mothers uh, oh, who are yeah. flower fiends, flower power, um, what I wanted to share and leave the episode off with is I would love to encourage just like you, our listeners to grow both edibles and flowers because the Mama Faella special, my mom grows this prolific garden every year. Anytime anyone in our, anyone comes over or anytime we go to anyone's house in the summer, my mom takes a piece of tinfoil, so, so fancy, a piece of tinfoil. And in that piece of tinfoil, she puts a wet paper towel and she walks around her garden and she picks basil, thyme, parsley, yep. rosemary. Wow. Mm-hmm. And then she picks a sunflower, a rudbeckia, mm-hmm. you know, an iris, whatever else is blooming. And she makes the most rustic yep. bootleg gardeners, like tin, tin flower, tin foil wrapped bouquet, <laughs> but the, it smells unbelievable. And it brings so much joy to everyone we know because you're getting a little edible and a little, yep. you know, joyful flower. And I just feel like it's like her heart to whoever she's gifting it to. And like, that's what I'm truly excited about, you know, having my mm. own garden and my own space is like, all I want to do is just make like tin foil wrapped bouquets and give them to people, Aww. you know? So I love that you say basil because like basil, even the leaves, I think is a filler in a bouquet is kind of fun because they're a nice smell. Mint too. Mint as well. I know Mint we didn't is, talk yes. about fillers, but the, a lot of my herbs and food plants, I'll sell Pop those right off in too. There. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I'm not that good at making them. Sorry. I'm saying I sell those off the floor. She'll take them and make something very beautiful. Oh, yeah. baby's breast too. Are so, baby's I mean, breast. It's not a food plant, but they're so easy to grow. If you guys need a simple filler, baby's breast, but you have to continue to grow it all season long. But they're totally. beautiful. I love your mom. Aw. So I love sweet. your Thank mom. Thank you for she sharing sounds, that. She sounds like a special lady. And I love that you grow hostas in, in her name. And they're a great shade plant too. Their hostas are like such a great land, yeah, you know, they're garden easy. plant. Yeah. So this was such a fantastic conversation. I've adored getting to know you. Our listeners are obviously going to want to come hang with you. So where can we find you on Instagram, on Clubhouse, where you and I met? You have your own room. Um, you know, where can everyone find you? And we're going to put all your links in the show notes as well. Thank you. This has just been so good. And and for everyone that's listening, thank you for taking time out of your day to, to listen to us talk. And hopefully you're inspired to just grow something something um, one thing yeah. just grow one just, thing yeah just one thing um you can find me at blooming hills farm on instagram you can find me at your grandma's garden and house plants on clubhouse and you also can find me um a group of urban farmers myself brandon serrator at grow food for life on instagram where we share different profiles and other urban farmers and what they're doing. So that's where you can find me at. Those will all be linked in the show notes. I had fun hosting one of the panels at the Grow Food for mm-hmm. Light Clubhouse Summit. I just also wanted to say Brooklyn's maiden name is Hill. So Blooming Hills Farm is a fun, mm-hmm. very fun play on your name. So we'll link there. And thank you for this flower power hour. And follow Brooklyn to see her flowers on Instagram. And I'll keep my Snapdragon update on Instagram as well, because I'm very curious with the half pinching experiment. So thank you, Brooklyn. You're the best. Talk soon. Thank you. Thank you, Brooklyn. She's just so lovely. Go follow her. She does so many different things. So I've linked all of her links in the show notes. Go follow her everywhere. I can't wait to watch her garden grow this summer. I can't wait to watch my garden grow this summer. Man, I'm so tickled by flowers. It was a real surprise, but Melody has a whole cut flower garden patch, I guess, garden bed in her larger garden. And it's honestly one of my favorite parts of her garden. It's been so fun to watch these poppies come alive and zinnias. We had some pesky mice in the greenhouse eat two flights of zinnia seeds, but we bought some seedlings that we've planted that we're watching. It's just been the best. Some cosmos. So yeah, flowers bring people joy. Don't we all want a little more joy in our lives? Right, plant friends? I'll keep you posted with Melody's Cut Flower Garden on my Instagram and YouTube channel. Thank you to our newest Patreon members. 
Okay, sweet plan friends. I hope that for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere experiencing summer, number one, I hope you're staying cool with all these cuckoo heat waves going everywhere. Not a fan. Billy and I do not have air conditioning in our cabin and we have been extremely sweaty. But I hope that you are taking time to go outside and be with plants and disconnect. It's been a long, hard winter. It's been kind of a long, cooler spring in the beginning. And I just hope that everybody takes some time to disconnect from screens, reconnect with plants around you, whether it's indoors or outdoors. And through doing that, reconnect with yourself. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, as always, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friend, thank you for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure you're subscribed to the show so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, why don't you click over to the review section and leave us a review? It would be tremendously helpful for the show, so thanks in advance. If you're looking for more planty content or ways to help and support the show or engage with our community, we've got a ton of options for you. So first, there's the free Bloom and Grow Plant Parent Personality Test. It is a super fun three-minute test that I made for you that pairs you with your Plant Parent Personality Profile, where you'll learn your planty strengths and weaknesses and get a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley tailored just for you. The test lives at Bloom and growradio.com slash personality and you have to let me know what your results are on Instagram. You can find me on Instagram at Bloom and Grow Radio. If you're interested in supporting Bloom and Grow Radio, consider becoming a Patreon plant friend of the show. Patreon plant friends are members of the community who support the show monetarily on a monthly basis for as little as $4 a month and these magical humans help support the show and bring our content to as many planty eyes and ears as possible. Once you join, you'll also get the secret password to our Facebook group, which I like to call the plantiest corner of the internet. We have a lot of fun over there. You can become a Patreon plant friend at patreon.com slash bloom and grow radio. And of course, you can also just join our newsletter that I like to call the Garden Club. When you join our Garden Club, you'll receive a free download of the exclusive Molly Mansfield Keep Blooming print, which is so adorable. And I'll slide into your inboxes, usually only around twice a month with plant care tips, recent episodes, and announcements. You can join at bloomandgrowradio.com slash community. And for anything else, plant friends, I'm here for you. So feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. Thanks again for listening. It is my honor and delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing. plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar and literally every post ever created about Hoya will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click the community plan. Hi. 
hot take plant friends. There is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and plant projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm. 